Rewind to Dynamite time. John Pollock and waiting with you on Wednesday night, March the 27th. Hello, Way. Hey, John. Welcome. Thank you. I yeah. feel welcome. You should. I mean, this is your show. It's not my show. It's our show. It's oh. the people's show. Yes. Uh, the, the people's show. Yes. Well, we have uh, lots to discuss tonight. Dynamite taking place from Tantra Videotron. In Quebec City, I, you know what? It, um, maybe you should be teaching French instead if of. If there that. is my match of the night was Taz versus French because it was beyond entertaining mm -hmm. during the picture in picture commentary. I, by about the third break, I was wishing Kate from Montreal was doing this review because I think it would have been priceless to hear her reactions to. Taz and really the entire broadcasters trying to grapple with French, interpret French chants from the crowd. Well, I could have really used a, a translator for some of those chants. I had no no idea what they were saying. Well, it's um, you know, it's they're it's like they were chanting in a different language. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, way, what are you doing on Sunday, April the seventh? I'll be going to WrestleMania night two in philadelphia what do you want to do that afternoon before we go to wrestlemania night two uh i'll probably want to you know grab a drink somewhere could i suggest a place sure okay, this is just just between you and i okay. how about you and i meet up at 2 30 p.m at drinkers pub at 1903 chestnut street in philadelphia between 2.30 and 4.30, and then you and I can uh, hop on over and take the transit over to Lincoln Financial Field, which will take us about 25 to 30 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time to hang out, have some food, maybe a drink or two before WrestleMania, and then go on over to the stadium. How does that sound? That sounds oddly specific. Um but that sounds like a great time. Do I should do I need to um, pay for entry into this establishment? Here's what it's going to set you back. Nothing. Just what? come show up at the appropriately named Drinker's Pub. Okay? <sighs> they don't want you to eat. They don't want you to consume. They they, just they want, want you to eat. No, you could you could Okay, they want food. you to do all of these things, but their priority is they are a Drinker's Pub. Um Yes. Okay. So we will be doing this official, official post wrestling slash poison rana meetup on Sunday afternoon, Drinkers Pub, nineteen. You covered the address. Oh, I'm sorry. It's nineteen oh three Chestnut Street. There you go. Yeah. Throw it into your Google Maps if you have time. Make it out. You'll have plenty of time to get to Lincoln Financial Field. That is going to be the post wrestling poison rana hangout um, Sunday afternoon. Yeah, some of you guys have been asking us here, yeah, are we doing anything uh, for WrestleMania this year? We're we're not doing anything like, you know, like a live podcast that that that's going to require like ticketing or anything. This is just a, a very casual listener meetup. If you happen to be in town, want to grab some drinks with fellow listeners and maybe some of the hosts that you listen to on these podcasts, uh 2:30 p.m. Sunday afternoon, Drinkers Pub. That's right. We're doing a very uh, Brandon Silvestri type of meetup. I'm um, sorry, I don't get it. What does that mean? It's going to be very oh, low, low key. Okay, yes. Uh, so there you have it. Um, we'll have that information up on the site and our various socials that you can check out. Also want to mention that today we had two really informative guests on Pollock and Thurston. We had CJ Donald on. Um, he runs, he, he's, a, he's a corporate attorney and was on to talk with us about the WWE's consensual relationship policy that Brandon and I reported on on Tuesday that we were able to um, get get a hold of 
and put a story out about that. So we got his reaction from a legal perspective, looking at the policy, as well as some of the overarching questions people might have in regards to the Janelle Grant suit, where it stands now as a civil case, what are the steps that a Vince McMahon is taking at the moment in terms of putting together a defense and what are the dates that we should be uh, paying attention to that are coming up in the next few months as well. So a uh, great chat there. And then Brad Baluchian, who is the author of this new book called The Six Pack that I had talked about. And this, he, he took a number of figures from the December 26, 1983 card at Madison Square Garden, the night where Iron Sheik won the title and sort of went on this journey to track down these various uh, performers and do almost these mini biographies of meeting them in person, what they're up to now and their careers. But there was a, a really interesting uh, deep dive into the WWF national expansion era and speaking to people that were working in the head office at the time in the mid 80s, including Jim Troy, uh, including like their main accountant. So he got a lot of interesting information, company documents and stuff that was not out there prior. So he was on the show as well. So if you want to check out today's edition, it's up on the WrestleNomics and post wrestling feeds for everyone to consume. And maybe, um, you know, one, one thing I like to do at times is I will turn on my video game of choice and I will listen to a podcast. So maybe you want to listen to Pollock and Thurston while playing a game. And well, that's <laughs> not going to be the easiest uh, segue over because I want you to hear the wellness policy about video games. So pause Pollock and Thurston and give <laughs> your attention to number 38 video games with Nick Shiner. That is correct. Well, maybe after you're done listening to um, Pollock and Thurston as you're playing your favorite video game, which is what, by the way, John? What What is the game that you like to play? Um, NBA Jam. Oh, what fantastic choice. Put on NBA Jam, listen to Pollock and Thurston, and then when you're done, check out the Wallens Policy, policy number 38, where uh, Jordan, Neil, and I got to speak to uh, a, a, an edu educator and an advocate for um, video games uh, as a tool for education. So um, Nick was uh, wonderful to speak to about the topic, um, something that, you know, I personally more so just kind of regarded as like um, – a hobby that doesn't like wouldn't add a whole lot um per, uh, constructive to to my life but um i i thought nick made some really great points in advocating for you know uh video games as a medium rather than just a toy or, or something that might be detrimental to your health um something that could be uh, very beneficial in in several different ways so if you're a fan of video games or if you're not check out the wellness policy did did you find that there are some like similarities in terms of like what you were hearing from from him uh, on the show about like video games and sort of your own um, enjoyment of like Lego that I think for a generation, I mean, like video games are not restricted to an age bracket. It's something that has gone well, below, well beyond that. I would argue Lego is not that different. Um, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say anything that might be considered a children's story, although I'll say like video games are probably, um, maybe um uh vilified a lot more in our society than something like you know lego is um uh, video games are i i think you know at, at what some points like um they were attempted to be legislated against and 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 censored and maybe held responsible for a lot of things that um now i think would almost be laughable to suggest um so I, we get into all of that and and nick does a great job of course kind of you know giving his expert opinions yes um yeah i, I mean that 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 is where you would start when it comes to legislation number one video games and then eventually you get to gun control right like that would be that would be your order oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. all right let's get into some of the news items uh for the day mike rotunda was interviewed by bill apter over at sports Kita. And Mike Rotunda explained that uh, Bray Wyatt is not going to be going into the Hall of Fame this year. He stated, with Wyndham passing, I thought they were going to immediately put Wyndham into the Hall of Fame, which he will be at some point. But I think WWE reassessed stuff and thought it was too soon to go there with our family. 
and the reactions and the stress it would put on us. We got a call from WWE that said that Hunter wanted to do a Zoom call. We were thinking they were going to tell us what was going to happen at WrestleMania, and Hunter said, you guys are going to get inducted. You and Barry, Wyndham, were part of the first WrestleMania. It was very flattering and actually less stressful on us with Wyndham passing, just the mental capacity of it. And obviously, it's a great honor because you're getting honored for what you spent 40 years doing. So um, that, that would answer the question regarding Bray Wyatt. And I was curious when we heard... Um, through Dave Meltzer's reporting that WWE, they had confirmed Leah Maya via privately, but not Bray Wyatt. And part of me was thinking, is that like the, the culmination of the documentary? Like that would be a closing scene of the documentary, but obviously seeing this, like that is, is not going to be um, the call this year. And probably an aspect that, you know, fans are not necessarily thinking of, of that this is still very fresh for the family. And that would probably be quite a lot to be going through. Um, to have to prepare that and just just the, you know, j just the sheer anxiety and what, what comes with that of something that is still very fresh for the family. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what, what that would be like. You know, um, obviously, this is all kind of like in good nature, sort of like celebration of the man's life. But even something like that, just kind of, you know, even seeing this person's face all, all throughout town and just he hearing so many people talk about him. I, I, I can imagine that being a very, very difficult process for anybody who is, you know, close to him, um, especially his family members. So, uh, uh, you know, we're grateful that uh, Mike Rotunda gave us this sort of clarification because I, I imagine there might have been some questions, um, especially considering reported or at least like rumored, you know, list of um, of, of uh, inductees this year. Um, so I think the audience, I, I have to imagine everybody who hears something like this would more than accept um, that sort of decision making. Yeah. I mean, it does sound like this was an idea that was on the table and at least being uh, discussed at some point. By the way, um, when do you think they'll announce uh, Liam Ivia? I, I'm guessing Monday. I would think that that probably, yeah, next week at, at some point, whether it be they do their usual like afternoon news release and then promote it on the show, or if you weave it into the actual story, given um, that hmm. it would be Dwayne Johnson inducting his grandmother. So I, hmm. I would think like that's probably our last announcement coming early next week. Okay. Becky Lynch is on her whirlwind book tour, uh, promoting, uh, the book. I've not had a chance to, uh, to, to get a copy of this book, but I've, I've heard it's, it's very good. And one of her stops was on the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani. And we're going to play a short clip. And this is Becky Lynch, uh, discussing the allegations against Vince McMahon and details that have come forward. And Becky Lynch being someone that, um, it, it's tough. She's doing this huge media tour and you've heard multiple interviews where she has been asked about Vince McMahon, who is featured, you know, significantly in her book. So let's hear Becky's answer. Those allegations are horrible, man. And, and it's so hard to listen to because that's not my experience. He, he was so good to me and Vince had a, a genius about him and he was not the easiest to work with. He is responsible for for all of the, the the things in my life by building WWE, and uh, we've had some ups and downs, but he was always good to me as as a person, um, and always treated with me with respect, and I felt like I had earned a lot of respect from him, and he gave me a lot of respect, and then you're hearing this other side, which is which is not the person that I know. And that's that's really hard. That's that's really hard, especially when you're a woman in this business and you're a woman who has been trying to push things to be equal. But it, look, that that that's the other part of it. Right. Like it's not there's 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 not a third party that was making things unequal. You know what I mean? And so 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 that's the other that's the other side of things. And that, that was the kind of things that w I think I write about in the book was kind of a little bit eye rolly, you know, in that, uh, like, here's a women's evolution. Here's a women's revolution. Who are you freeing us from? You. Right. <laughs> you know? And, and so in that, like, a lot of that felt very condescending. 
in, in, in some regards. So that was Becky Lynch uh, discussing the allegations against Vince McMahon, how she has tried to, um, you know, just digest and try and make sense of, you know, obviously when we're talking about, you know, we have heard through John Cena and other performers that had this relationship with Vince McMahon of sort of squaring this aspect of Vince McMahon. And, you know, it, we, we look at the fact like here is Vince McMahon who hardly has had a uncheckered past. I mean, this is somebody that has had allegations against him, but it seems like these were at least things that people were divorced from or had at least there was plausible deniability or not a, you know, he was never convicted of anything or he was never charged with anything. And in this case, like this is, you know, in this 60 some odd page lawsuit, it's very hard to square away the details. I'd be really curious how many of the people in the company have sat down and read that suit. I'm sure it's a significant number. Um, I would also think there's probably some who don't want to read it. Sure. Yeah. Um, whether or not they've read, you know, all 60 something pages, I would have to imagine. Um, they know the details. Yeah. Especially, I mean, as they know enough um, of what is alleged to, to have taken place. And um you know this 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 answer from from Becky Lynch um, clearly you know indicates somebody who's been struggling with this sort of conflict of of emotions of um, what she is conveying to be disgust and she did disapprove uh, obviously of like um, you know and anything that 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 the 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 victim um, um, you know Janelle Grant has has uh, alleged to to have uh, suffered um, while at the same time this um, seemingly very wonderful working relationship she seems to she seemed to have with Vince McMahon um so how do you kind of you know balance that and, and acquit that um some would say one completely like you know fuck your work relationship like you're if this person is a monster you know like like but um I I, I can't really speak for her just because like she, she has a personal relationship with this person, much like with John Cena. And because of the status of the lawsuit at the moment, there's really nothing we can definitively say at the moment. Um, so for her, I, I, I it, it's a it's a tough question to to sort of like answer, but I feel like she gave as honest of a response as she could. Um, despite the stumbling, I have to think she's thought about this answer for weeks. Um, and she's been asked this in several interviews, just once that I've heard. Um, mm -hmm. How did you read the the back half of that, where she was, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, and this was something that a lot of like that we spoke about during this, like their whole campaign of moving forward with the women. And here was this; it was almost as though they were presenting it as though. This ban has been lifted or something. And as Becky points out, like this was the company that was presenting the women in this way. It was like, we are liberating ourselves from ourselves. Uh, that yeah. was the company. And I think, you know, she kind of like looks into sort of like, like these women were presented in Vince McMahon's vision. And mm -hmm. this was something that, you know, from the top down is something that I, I think Becky is certainly struggling with in, in terms of like, this was, a portrayal of the women and now you see that this person that was like how did he view a lot of these women right well i i again without like knowing how she specifically phrases it in the book i mean in the answer she does not specifically blame vince mcmahon although i guess that's inferred just because he's in charge of it all right but it, you know when like the, the blame and the answer seem to be more about the company and that might encompass you know writers and just you know the other executives but when we're talking about who's really to blame for it yes you could probably name one person like becky lynch in the past has been critical of either her own booking she was critical of her uh portrayal of with seth rollins and their relationship on air just even in this interview and in prior interviews i've heard so mm -hmm. um she's not she's at the status now where she can get away with like criticizing booking her own booking certainly and maybe just the booking of the entire company so she she's certainly it's it it sound it makes her sound honest to be able to criticize the bullshit of the women's revolution branding when you are the the people that created this sort of oppression in the first place she also mentioned in the 
interview and it's about an hour long if you want to check out the the wednesday edition of the mma hour mentioning she has two months left on her contract and they have not sat down to discuss a, a new contract and also believe she'll likely be on the first night of wrestlemania with rhea ripley yeah yeah also had some um pretty interesting things to say when asked about ronda rousey's um well her statements um in recent interviews talking about uh, I guess um, her uh, Ronda Rousey's run in the WWE and um, Ro- uh, Becky said she, she she pretty much stated that she was it was you know her first outing at WrestleMania 34 with Kurt Hunter and Stephanie like it was a very carefully rehearsed laid out match and she came out and it was probably the match of the show for many and everyone was raving about Ronda and sort of. They took the training wheels off and it was sort of, well, she's she's made it. And the fact was, as Becky stated, like she was she was not a great wrestler. She was somebody that needed, you know, the the proper preparation and and just like uh, going uh, through. the. And she felt that it was a disservice to Rhonda to put her in such a, I guess, uh, in a spot more more designed for, I, I think, a better end. Like basically they're saying they they put a lot. They put too much on Ronda too soon. Is yeah, is what I mean, she said. was not like downgrading Ronda. She mm-hmm. was speaking to like the realities of someone that d- did not grow up where this was the be all end all, like it was for Becky. This was you know a uh, an alternate career path, but one that she had a tremendous athleticism and a knack for it. Um, but certainly, like we saw her her struggles, and I mean, she is kind of just juxtaposing like she has had. Um, her ups and downs, uh, Becky, that is, has had her ups and downs in WWE, but she loves her experience. And Rhonda, you you get the sense like she has, um, you know, she clashed quite quite a lot within her time in WWE as well. And it's just interesting to see both of these books out a week apart and mm-hmm. uh, to contrast them. I'm almost at, the, I'm, I'm through the MMA part. Um, the first like 100 pages on her MMA stuff, I think it's incredibly insightful into just her mindset. I think a lot of people, some will disagree with her and how she um, made certain choices about her career and such, but I don't doubt that you're getting her honest feelings on how everything went down and the pressure she placed upon herself. And, and at the end, even after the Amanda Nunez fight, which as soon as that fight was over, she knew her career was done. And a month later, Dane is calling her, you want another fight with Amanda Nunez in Brazil? Like after that Jeez, fight, really? Dana was going to give her another fight with Amanda Nunez after that one-sided fight. And how Ronda would you have, how would she have, how would you have justified that um, with like the way that fight went? They would have just gone with it. Cause it ended up being like Amanda Nunez and Raquel Pennington. Like they needed challengers for Amanda Nunez and they were going to go with Rousey, I guess. Um, but that was Rhonda said, that's the first time I ever turned down a fight from Dana White. And she was like, no, I'm done. Uh, like she was completely done after the Amanda Nunez fight. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think if you, it's, it's certainly the most insight you're going to get into Ronda about that last year, but from the Holly Holm fight onward. So um, yeah, um, I think both books will probably grab a lot of interest from, from people. AEW Double or Nothing, they have announced for Sunday, May the 26th at the MGM Grand Garden Arena with collision taking place in the building the night prior. So this is the tentative lineup that weekend way. Saturday, collision in Las Vegas and the WWE card in Saudi Arabia. Sunday, collision, or sorry, Sunday is double or nothing head to head with NXT Battleground that is happening that night in Savannah, Georgia. Um, a, a, a typical week here sure. in the world of pro wrestling at this point. I mean, are you sure New Japan doesn't have a show at some point that weekend as well? You know, I mean, just, just throw, just one throw one it on to the menu on top of it. I mean, why not? Let's just get it all out there in one weekend. Yeah, this is going to be a packed weekend. Um, What what, what do you think about the um, head-to-head with with NXT and what kind of, um, Mm -hmm. you know, what what kind of choices your your fan base is going to have to make? So I I feel like there's, um, you know, uh, uh, there's sort of an unofficial rankings of, like, uh, importance, you know, uh, in terms of, like, show. Um, and, and what might be priority for a, a, a general wrestling fan who might be interested in all of this stuff. And I think um, an addition of um, collision 
is, you know, somewhere like in the lower third, I would say of like, you know, that, that pack when we're just talking AEW WWE content. Um, but a takeover would be above a regular edition of collision, but an AEW pay-per-view is almost at the very top. So even though uh, an addition uh, like a like a what is it NXT P uh, PLE might take a good chunk out of you know your collision fan base, I don't think it'll hurt an AEW pay per view viewer like because those are still rare enough and they're high quality enough, um, even at a cost. You know, it, it, it's being it's perceived as a premium event, and I think it's something that'll do just as well with or without the 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 NXT head to head. And also a really interesting um, addition that. Uh, AEW has made beginning with Dynasty is the ability now to in the US to buy the pay-per-view outside of BR Live. You can now get it on Triller TV, pay-per-view.com, YouTube, they're making it available to buy. Yeah. And they're also doing a group of the next three shows, as I understand, that you can buy together in the US. So um I managed to do this through AEW Plus, um, through my very trusted NordVPN um usage um you were they're offering a combo pack where you could purchase all three of the pay-per-views for like the the next upcoming three AEW pay-per-views for fifty dollars i don't know if that's offered on the um american side of things uh but i you know combo deals are things that they have offered in the past um so there are a number of, way, of ways to, to get the show. I see a lot of people in the U.S. buying outside of BR Live because we hear nothing mm -hmm. but problems with that. And I'll say when I order shows on Triller TV and even when I order UFC pay-per-views on, on YouTube, like zero issues. Yeah, I, I would think so as well. I, and this is all really good news for AEW, right? The more sort of outlets you have for people exactly. to purchase your show, the, the, the better. So I... I, I wonder, I suppose it's something to do with, um, you know, their uh, loyalty to Warner that that it's taken this long for something like this to be lifted. But I mean, really, last time should have been the last straw, you know, for for any any sort of BR live issue. So coming up, uh, there's a lot of big events coming up uh, between WrestleMania with Stand and Deliver, Supercard of Honor, all the GCW collective shows, which include Bloodsport, um, but nothing bigger than this Sunday. It is the road to Sakura Genesis in Hamamatsu, where Great Okan will defend the KOPW championship against Tangaloa. And Great Okan's match stipulations were voted in favor of, and we are going to have the rural revitalization match between these two men. This will be a, uh, a best two out of three rounds format. So the first round will be a 10-minute most covers match where every pinfall attempt Results in one point. Then the second oh. round, I mean, how do you come back from a 10-minute most covers match? You do a five-minute eel-eating contest, which really should be the third round. I think that should be the deciding one. Oh, no, John. The the, the concept is... No, you, you're right. You're right. Um, you you stuff yourself full of eel. Yes. Um, I think and, we know where this is going in round three. And then what is round three? Round three is a scrap match, and... I I think the unofficial rules is the first one to vomit loses. <laughs> um, so this KOPW title, I mean, it's it's really um, broadened the creativity. Uh, I would say of 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 New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, and it feels it feels like it. You know, we've seen some pretty crazy KOPW um, stipulations in the past. This might top them all. I don't think they've ever uh, done e eel. Or well, any sort of food eating. Um, I can confirm a... they have never had an eel eating <laughs> contest. Okay, Anoki missed that one. Yes, uh, I, I, I mean, you know, for us, I mean, I recognize the KOPW title is just like kind of their way of of just trying everything. But like, this is like the most DDT New Japan has ever felt with this with a stipulation like this, and it, the fact that we're talking about it, it, it's like I'm interested. Like, I'm going to be going on about my way to to see what they do here is that what does that say is more about me or or just um what all what i'll you... say is that when i read these <laughs> stipulations um before i was even done reading the word eel i was thinking of you so I mean, yeah. you have really branded yourself the question is way will we get an eel turn in this match <laughs> oh um i i am gonna promise ahead of time we're gonna chat about this match next <laughs> monday night when we are okay. uh when we are next live yes uh did you have a chance at all to see the brutus beefcake dark side episode yes i did mm -hmm. so number one the 
several things that I liked about this. Ep- this is not my favorite episode this season, but I thought number one, them tracking down Dr. Mutaz Habal, the cranial facial surgeon that worked on Ed Leslie's face after the parasailing accident. What an incredible find that they got this guy who put his face back together. I thought this was um, this was just a great, great guest to have on the show. Number two, I thought some of the reenactments, especially of the parasailing incident, were some of the best that Dark Side has done. I think this mm-hmm. season they have had some great ones with the Terry Gordy episode, but recreating the parasailing accident. And Brian Blair, that I maybe I had heard this, but I did not recall that he was there at the mm-hmm. uh, at the scene of the crime essentially when this uh, not it. only there but like semi responsible for it even taking place i mean you know he, and he, he, obviously like everyone was drunk they should not have been parasailing like yeah. this sounded like just a disaster of an idea he felt i mean you could tell the in the man's voice he felt incredibly guilty of even you know being there but like he, it's etched into his memory so i i really do trust you know b, b. brian blair's account but b- basically like they knew that this parasailing in this friend's backyard was not safe. And at the end of the party, they were like, oh, thank goodness nobody got hurt. But B. B Brian Blair and his friends jump in. And they're like, let's go parasailing. And so they they load the thing back up. And I mean, tragedy struck. You know, this I, I mean, obviously, as fans, we we kind of know about about the um the, the injury, of course. But the extent of it and, and sort of like the horror of it was not really uh, conveyed, at least just watching the wrestling product. This episode did a great job of, of conveying just that. Yeah, it was like, it. it's kind of grotesque to look at it, but this is sort of what pro wrestling draws from is that, you know, when he, you knew about this accident and when he came back, he had the face mask. They even did the angle with Money Incorporated, like taking out Brutus's face. But I mean, you, they could have like really, I don't even want to say exploited if they felt, but you know, in terms of like the degree of like how this guy was just, his face was destroyed. It's like, they never went into like, um, you mean, you mean the WWE, the WWF at the time. Yes. Mm. When beefcake finally did make his, his comeback in the mm. ring, which is astonishing when you, you know, uh, know to the extent of it, because I, I don't know if fans quite at that time in like in the early nineties understood just how, miraculous it was that this man survived this much less right. came back and wrestled yeah i mean i wonder how much of it was just um due to like um it being the you know like maybe tonally not fitting what the product was at the time or maybe it just came down to like whether or not they really wanted to push brutus beefcake as that sort of serious like you know because that would be the type of angle for like a yeah. big baby face comeback and is brutus the guy that you wanted to portray in that light i mean who knows um, other people interviewed included, um, well, Brian Blair, as you mentioned, Eric Bischoff, who was kind of there to just be the heel on the show and mm-hmm. sort of this chapter of Ed Leslie being like pretty much Hulk Hogan's bag carrier for lack of a better term. And then you had, um, Missy Hyatt and his, and his wife, Missy Leslie. Who yeah. Met- a, a rare name to, to see twice um we had two missies yeah. yes and yeah. uh and the story of how these two they met in 1986 at the boston garden and then years later she got his number and texted him and said she had this fantasy of sleeping with him and it was a uh, love at first text they've been and, uh, together ever since i mean you know what um th- these days it, it's probably not well i mean those circumstances are pretty uncommon but i guess the nature of the uh, message delivery leading to a, 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 a very loving lasting relationship. Maybe not that uncommon. Yeah. yeah. And, and then they also spoke about the relationship or lack thereof between Ed Leslie and Hulk Hogan, who have had a weird friendship throughout their, their lives when they were very close. And like a number of years ago, like Ed Leslie, as I recall, was stating he was going to be putting out some like tell all book involving Hogan. And that went nowhere. But yeah, they had, I guess they're falling out. And then after the falling out, Hogan still uh, came and inducted him into the Hall of Fame. But the two haven't seen each other since this scene, which was 2019 that Mm -hmm. he went into the Hall of Fame and they don't have any relationship now. 
kind of sad, you know, um, and kind of sad. Um, like it, it just kind of makes the speeches from both men feel kind of fake or at least hopeful. Um, it seems like, you know, when on Ed Leslie's end, he wants to re rebuild that bond. But um, it's insinuated on the the the, the episode that Hogan ha was not happy about something involving this new uh, girlfriend at the time of Ed Leslie's. And th I think the suggestion was that she was getting involved in the business side of things uh, or or managing Ed Leslie to some extent and, and maybe asking for more money like so. I, yeah, uh, it sucks. I mean, you know, these two seem like best friends, brothers. Brother Brutai. Uh, well, that's the episode. I, I think, like, really, the, the stuff handling, like, the parasailing incident, I think, was, like, the, the strongest aspects of the, the episode. And, yeah, I, I thought, like, tra tracking down that doctor was a real great find on, on their behalf. Yeah. Like, whether or not you are interested in the subjects, I mean, th these are just excellent documentaries about um, topics that aren't going to be covered really anywhere else in professional wrestling at a bit done at a very high quality of production as well as research. So, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in any episode that they do. Raw on Monday did a million seven hundred twenty nine thousand viewers and a point five seven in the demo. So uh, going against this huge women's basketball game that did four point nine million viewers, Raw was still up three percent and that was a testament to the show and the big quarter was from nine to nine fifteen which in earnest began even like punk was out at about 10 to 9 so they were out there almost 25 minutes and this segment grew 18 percent in viewership from the prior quarter up to 2.2 million viewers uh, it was helped by the fact there were no ad breaks uh, either during this uh, quarter but a gigantic lift for the show and, you know, that was the big promoted segment on the show was CM Punk in Chicago. And, you know, the, the Rock showing up in the first quarter and the last quarter, um, neither appearance you were expecting. Uh, you weren't mm -hmm. expecting him at the beginning and you weren't expecting him to come back at, at the end of the show. So, I mean, there was growth in that last quarter. Um, but I, I think, you know, they wanted the surprise factor with, with Dwayne Johnson. And I guess that's you have to balance that of an advertised appearance that is going to gain you that interest versus doing something for a surprise for the live audience and telling your story within the body of that show. So I'm very curious to see what Monday's result will be in the ratings for a Dwayne Johnson promoted segment. Will it be significantly different? Will it spike the way a CM Punk segment has spiked or um, our audience is just kind of used to seeing Dwayne Johnson on WWE TV now. And you know, it, it, it's just, it's not as special. I wonder, um, I, 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 does this tell you that, uh, whether or not CM Punk might make a, um, a lot more frequent appearances during this re rehabilitation? Well, at least in Chicago, they are coming back to Chicago in June for a SmackDown. So I, I'm thinking CM Punk's going to be a SmackDown invite that, that yeah. particular night, that would be a smart move on their, on their part. But yeah, uh, it was a huge night for them uh, of what, what they drew and, and that quarter and, and the number, the fact they held up so well and even grew like this mm -hmm. was a monster basketball game that they were up against. And that was, um, you know, great. And they're probably going to do a pretty strong number on Monday going into Mania. And then NXT did 601,000 viewers and a 0.17 in the demo, up 6% in viewers, down 6 in the demo, which uh, did include this promo from Ridge Holland where he's stepping away. I actually thought Ridge, Pro Ridge Holland's promo was really good. Like this was mm -hmm. one of the uh, best things I think Ridge Holland has done. I thought he was very good in this segment. It showed a level of, I think, acting ability and I guess you could call range that I I didn't necessarily see within him. And I mean, the tastefulness of, of an angle like this um, is, I think, rightfully debated. But I think th the end result is you're getting to send talents down to NXT so that they can broaden their abilities, um, whether it be in ring or speaking on a microphone. And it's definitely providing that for Ridge Hall. How would you feel just like throwing this idea out there if this segment uh, or this this story involving Ridge Holland where he's second guessing himself and walking for injuring away, for injuring people and of course this for is injuring people and the Big person e, yeah. to motivate him to bring him back is Big E. Well, that sounds like it would be almost like a bit of a perfect sort of fairy tale, right? Um, I I I'm, I have no issue with this angle. I think it's you know it's a fair either. game for storytelling and. Um, 
if Big E is the one to sort of close it off, I think it gives you more, gives certainly like the critics a, a bit more of an impression that Big E is clearly on board with, with whatever they're doing. All right, let's get into Dynamite tonight from Quebec City. Uh, Russell Tick's reporting over 4,100 tickets out for the show, and we're starting things off with Will Ospreay and Katsuyori Shibata, rematch from New Beginning in Osaka from February 2017. And it starts off where Shibata is mounting him and working for the armbar, and they were telling this story that Sh Osprey, I mean, if this was a pure rules match, he would have been out of rope breaks real quickly because he constantly had to go to the rope to escape all of Shibata's uh, submission uh, su submissions. But then Osprey uh, just sits down, takes the kick, and Shibata waffles him. But then Osprey pops up. They're trading forearms, and they go to the floor. Osprey does a springboard forearm off the guardrail and then lands a boot in the corner. Big chops are delivered by Shibata and hits a sliding drop kick that sent Will Ospreay's head into Montreal. Then applies the STF. Again, Ospreay gets to the rope. And then after ducking a PK, Shibata hits him from behind. And then Ospreay holds on to the next attempt, gets knocked down, kip up, and a leaping kick connects for Ospreay. And then he fights the rear naked choke. And after going for the os cutter, it connects. Shibata kicks out at one. So now Osprey tries for another one. It stopped at the rear naked choke. He hook kicks his way out of it. And then after an elbow smash, lifts up Shibata, not for the Stormbreaker, but rather <laughs> the Storm Driver 93. The move that I just thought, oh, th this is perfect for Katsuori Shibata to take uh, anytime post-2017. Now, it was With obviously much safer than like yes. the one Kenny took at Forbidden Door. To but crap, we have never seen one at the level of the Kenny original mm -hmm. last June, mm -hmm. uh, but then follows with the hidden blade and it's will Osprey winning in 18 minutes and 56 seconds. The two bow and embrace one another afterwards and they are one apiece. So seven years from now, they will have the rubber. Match. <laughs> oh God. You think so, man? It will Shabbat still be wrestling in seven yes. years. Yeah. Yes, I yeah think you're will. right. Um, I thought this was an excellent match, John. You know, um, this felt like the level of match that they would have had if these two had met in the G1. I didn't feel any different to me. Like it, it, it felt like it any, was any restriction Shibata had been stepping away from or mm -hmm. holding himself to seem out the window after the Danielson match. <laughs> the man, even like a safe looking Tiger Driver 91, is still an unfathomable bump. For somebody who went through what he he went through, he didn't just take that. He took like a German here, and just oh, not to a mention Luva kick. Like yeah. I mean, you know, it was like will protecting and stuff. But I mean, nonetheless, I mean, the, the guy is not taking any. Um, you know, he, he's not cutting out anything that has a degree of danger to the head. And I I I I have enough trust in AEW's uh, medical testing to to at least put my mind at ease or at least i really want to put my mind at ease watching katsuyori shibata wrestle this sort of style um i mean it's not like this is his first very physical match he's had since coming back i mean it's it's probably up there but um it it, it it's it, it made for like a really really good match here you know like every bit i think as you would have imagined really intricate and smart chain wrestling opening things up and then they just get into this really hard hitting striking battle especially from shibata and then your your high impact moves leading to some big early kickouts from both men very physical match with like shibata again taking some of those high angle suplexes um, now I don't know if you agree with me, but I don't know if the crowd energy really got to the level that I think this match was designed to garner. Now, I don't know if that's due to like, so they were really into Osprey and, and that's one thing that stood out to me. It was like a, a, immediately coming out here. Those obviously it's the wrestling matches, but it's especially the promos that I think have already uh, elevated Will Osprey to such a very high level that even upon walkout, he already is perceived as I think one of the top baby faces of this entire promotion. Um, Comes out there. Oh, he's wrestling. <laughs> but you know, for some reason, like I didn't sense the level of escalation in crowd energy throughout the end of the match. And I don't know if that's due to, um, maybe just the, the, you know, the result of this match being pretty easily predictable or people not being as like familiar with Shibata or was it due to the size of the crowd? Um, I, I thought overall, like this crowd was not some rabid, um, 
Quebec mm-hmm. audience that you would be associating with. Now, granted, yes, we're talking about 4,000 as opposed to like, you know, 10,000 plus a, a, for a Bell Center show, for instance. In a building that can hold up to what? Like 18? I don't know what, what how much how big this building is. Um, it's it pretty can, big, at least for, so, for certain things that can hold up to 18,000. Well, then yeah. that's um that's a lot of emptiness then in, inside. Even like for the main event, it really wasn't until very late that I thought the audience got into things in that one. So I would like this was a show like I, I didn't think the crowd was a big enhancement for a lot of, of the show. Not to say they didn't have their moments. They mm-hmm. did. But it was it was not as though it was um evident on a consistent basis throughout. Mm. Yes, I, I noticed the same. We also had like quite a few by AEW standard video packages on the show, starting with this Brian Danielson one incorporating ROH footage, going to New Japan, and then after being uh, not cleared to wrestle, making his return in 2018, coming to AEW and promising that this is going to be the most epic year of his career. And yeah, this was like, you you've owned, you own this footage, let's get some mileage out of it. And this was an example of doing so. It's really nice to see AEW continue to invest a lot more into their video production um, uh, upgrades o- over the past year, I'll say. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, I mean, you have this man's career on file and um, something like this. I mean, we all know who Brian Danielson is, but believe it or not, there might be some people out there who aren't really as familiar with the story. But even if you do know what his story is, a video like this only serves to make Danielson feel like a bigger star. You know, and it does that doesn't hurt that we get a refresher about his journey thus far leading up to his next match. And and it just adds a level of importance, I think, even just to his next obstacle. So, I, I mean, I hope they're building the type of team to work on pieces like this for every significant wrestler or significant match coming up uh, on their future pay-per-views. Renee is with Matthew and Nicholas, and they complain about her line of questioning. They prefer Alex Marvez. And they had some goals when they returned to AEW. The first was retiring Sting, which they did, restructuring the Elite by bringing in Okada and getting back their tag titles. And they're going to avenge their loss to Private Party, which ruined a year of their lives back when they lost to them in October of 2019. And then they instruct Renee to smile more. Right, yes. Uh, So I guess they they, uh, successfully ended Sting's career by losing to him. Yes. He was going to retire anyway, right? Well, I think that's the the purpose of the line. Okada pulls up in his Ferrari. And uh, I think we should add, um, like, a a, if in fact, if in fact, Okada uh, was went all the way to Quebec City uh, and they rented a a Ferrari for him. I mean, this this would have been quite the journey for one Kazuchika Okada. I'm hoping they did this in Toronto last week. I I'm willing to bet that that's the case. Um, I I'm looking for a still shot of the actual venue, and um, I can't imagine they would have had him either drive this Ferrari or anybody like or just keeping Okada up here for for a whole week, or just even flying him. He out literally here. pulled up in the car, and they did a cutaway to him watching the monitor during the Bucks match with Private Party. I'm simply looking in the background for signs of uh, whether or not this could actually be Toronto, but I have to think that this was Toronto. There's I really no, hope so. Like, it's not worth the airfare nor the trouble of the man to to come all the way up here just to do that. So that takes us to the Young Bucks and Private Party in the AEW Tag Title Tournament. And uh, this was a fun match. They hit the silly string over the guardrail onto Matt, and then Nick hits a falcon arrow to Mark Quinn off the guardrail to the floor. Um, I was really glad that Nick's footing was secure on this guardrail because he would have some footing issues later on, but Ooh. better to uh, slip later than on this guardrail spot. Um, this is when Taz first starts to discover the French chance and tries to, uh, tries to, he, he is not as advanced on Duolingo as Matthew Jackson's. You should get on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Matt stops a, a, Twist of fate by Cassidy, and then Nick trips him from the floor, and they hit a super slice bread onto Isaiah Cassidy with Quinn making the save. At this is this is the Motor City Machine Guns move. Uh, you're right. Yes, yeah. they were. Which I'm I'm thinking now the best spot if if they are coming in would be mm-hmm. the tag title win at the pay per view, and then the guns walk out as the first challengers. Mm-hmm. Just, that's your setup. That would be a mm-hmm. great way to. Uh, are they in Detroit it. anytime soon? Coming up. Uh, no announcements for Detroit yet, so okay. they they may have to wait on that one. 
They work on Mark Quinn's back for a while, including a German onto the edge of the apron. And as they go for the TK driver, they are stopped when Cassidy grabs Nick on the turnbuckle and Quinn does the roll up, which is the same way they beat them in 2019. And it was a great near fall. Like Matt waited till the absolute last second to kick out. Uh, they hit a gin and juice to Nick who rolls to the floor and private party hits more bang for your buck. And it's Nick returning to make the save. Nick gets the ring bell, which the powerful Rick Knox rips out of his arms. And this allows Matt to kick Cassidy low from behind. But then Quinn comes in nailing Matt with the ring bell that Knox also misses. And Nick gets the foot of his brother onto the rope to save, save the match. Quinn misses with a 630 and the Bucks go for the EVP trigger. And in a very rare instance, we had a, a botched finish here by the Bucks when Nick slipped as he was going for the EVP trigger, which was dubbed a uh, stutter step. It was a stutter step. And <laughs> to compensate, the two just both piled on top of Quinn for the pin in 13 minutes and 26 seconds. So, um, I mean, the, the match, I was, I was into this match. I thought there was a lot of cool stuff. It was great showcase for private party uh just ended on this uh awkward note well they could blame michael nakazawa i think just like they did for um <laughs> they don't playback. have the series anymore they can't do the explanation on uh on youtube yeah right yeah i guess yeah. they could take out an ad on collision and explain. i guarantee you if they haven't already they'll reference it and they'll joke about it on on their social media somehow i'm sure so later in the later in the show there's a spot where matt taven is almost in the identical spot going for a super kick and he slips and it was almost the same spot as Nick and hmm. he could have had some fun with it uh, as well afterwards. Cause I watched this and I was like, that's almost exactly where Nick slipped. And it was Taven going for the super kick in the, in their tag match. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, very good match here. You know, uh, these two teams have always had really great chemistry. And if you wanted to see this style of wrestling match, they definitely delivered a great sample of it. Mm hmm. There was a video on Kenosuke, Kenosuke Takeshita with Don Callis stating, this might be Swerve's house, but they're on their street in their neighborhood. Darby Allen is with Tony Hawk. What could go wrong? He explains that he will not be climbing Mount Everest, and he was going to be climbing it to help fund the skate park project of Tony Hawk's um, to help fund skate parks around the country. And they plug where you can donate at skatepark.org. And Darby says in uh, the scariest words on the show, I'm not climbing Mount Everest, but we have another plan. And then we see Tony Hawk uh, going, going hand, hand planting, hand planting on Darby's broken foot. Well, like on the cast. Yeah, right? on the cast. Yeah. So, I mean, I hope this was the plan. I hope he doesn't have a more <laughs> diabolical plan than this. I'll say, um, like, I thought he was going to literally get on a skateboard here. Oh, me too. Like, I, that's, you know, I, I felt like for a Darby Allen standards, this was a relatively tame thing. And which makes me think this was not the plan he meant. And that's still to come. He'll be like lighting his leg on fire or something. If the goal was to promote this Tony Cox skateboard project, um, or skate park project, um, this is all you needed to do, you know, an, an appearance on camera on AEW television talking about it. You didn't need to climb out Everest, dude. Like this is this achieved the same thing. So forget about that whole Everest thing. Yeah, I, you know, um, I would be I would be shelving the Everest idea, but I am. Uh, I would never be considering climbing Mount Everest. To it's only going to make him want to do it more. I bet. Next up is the four way. So the graphic. Has got. We also had Jericho and Hook um, with an interaction. Oh, backstage. that's right. That's right. Re uh, Renee is with Jericho and Hook, and Jericho reiterates what he said last week that Hook exceeded his expectations. It was Hook's first pinfall of his career, and Jericho's proud of him and says, after 33 years, I've never ran a school or trained anyone, but I am here to give you whatever advice you need. And Hook says, Well, I'll take it. He says, I know you're Chris Jericho, but on the other hand, you're Chris Jericho. So Hook is skeptical of him, but they are forming a temporary alliance moving forward. Is is that what, what we're getting out of this? I think we're getting the idea is that Hook is not the dumb baby face that's going to trust Jericho, but he is going in with to take eyebrow his advice. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So last week, Jericho teed up this segment by saying, I have a proposition for Hook. And it's going to be like his Arn Anderson. I said, 
you're inferring that from what? That he's going to advise him. He's going to be his okay. Advisor. He's going to be his manager. I, that's kind of what I took from this. Because like uh, I, because what Excalibur coming out of this said, uh, it seems like Lion Hook is is strong, and that to me more so indicates that they're going to ta- be a tag team again. Now that would make it. Would, what you're suggesting makes more sense. Are we talking about Jericho being a a manager like ringside for Hook? Well, he could set the record as the highest paid manager in pro wrestling history if he transitioned to becoming a manager. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I found it kind of hilarious that he had a proposition and wait, made us wait a whole week to be able to say, say, um, Hook, you can come to me for advice anytime. That's, that's a text. That's the major proposition. So, I mean, where this is going, obviously, I, I, I mean, I see a feud between these two, but... Um, can they make it interesting on the way there? Are you interested so far? Um, I mean, this is like the first week of it, so no. I'm, Hearing I'm Jericho not. say bet, I think is is going to be the draw for me. Okay. Um, we'll we'll see how long how long this goes. So we've got a four way number one contenders match. So the way the graphic is up is that you've got the four women, and then centered is Mercedes Monet. So the way this looks is that like. Five way. This is a number one contenders match to get a match with Mercedes Monet, who is above this championship. And instead, she is on commentary. And it was just weird because why are you on commentary? You're not scouting anyone here. You're not the one that's facing the winner out of all of this. Yeah, now, why is she in this match? I don't know what her she has no ties to this match. Well, the ties the outcome below. is not of any significance to her future. Well, okay, she she has set her sights on on Willow, or at least she's teased wanting a rematch against Willow. I think. Well, she's in the division. She, she and she has a right to you know be interested. She's scouting everybody. That's what I think. That's what we're supposed to think. Okay. I did not think Mercedes was that great on commentary. It felt very. Um, she she felt very out of place on, on commentary and was being very um, generic with her observations. So anytime a wrestler is on commentary, it's a chance for us to see like what their imp- improvisation improvisational skills are like as I butcher um my own improv. Um and I, I think the this highlight continues. was her calling she did call a code blue in advance. Right. But you know, we we were discussing whether or not Mercedes is somebody who I think clearly prefers maybe a scripted promo versus like going out there like a CM Punk and just kind of winging it. This was a chance to see what winging it might look in a smaller scale for her and not something that maybe comes as natural to her clearly as uh, maybe as some others. We're going to find out how Paul Heyman is at winging it. He said he's not writing a speech in advance for the hall of fame. He's going to, he's going to read the room when he gets there uh, in front of the crowd in Philadelphia. But but saying like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm winging it. Um, when your Paul Heyman is like saying, I'm not going to, you know, practice shooting free throws uh, w- before the game I- I- for Michael Jordan or something, you know, like he doesn't he lives his life preparing, I'm, I'm sure, with every moment or he's prepared so much that it's just second nature for him to to say to, to cut a promo. So all four fight on the floor and. uh Anna J hits a superplex onto Chris Statlander, which is broken up by a senton from Willow. And Blue then counters the babe with the power bomb into the code blue, which Statlander breaks up. Anna J takes Chris and hits a gory bomb on top of Sky Blue and goes for the Queen Slayer, which is avoided. And Willow kills Anna J with this missile drop kick. So we tease Willow and Chris Statlander going at it, but they're interrupted by Sky Blue, who shoves Willow into Chris. And then Willow hits this huge Death Valley driver onto Sky Blue on the edge of the apron. And that takes Sky Blue to the floor. Anna J counters the Wednesday Night Fever. And Statlander is sent to the floor as Willow is left with Anna J to hit the babe with the power bomb and wins in nine minutes and 50 seconds, which sets up Julia Hart and Willow Nightingale for the TBS title at Dynasty. Although you had Julia coming out and staring down Mercedes Monet and certainly feels attached to this program, whether she is inserted into the match, but. They did put up the graphic just listing the two as of now. I think they're trying to convey that like the, the winner of that title match will face Mercedes Monet. Uh, rankings be damned, which actually should be coming out at now. Uh, what, right now. Okay, so maybe we'll update people before that. But whatever. Like they're just trying to t- tie people to, to Mercedes. And 
I think the the path. Do, do you think they hold off Mercedes first match past Dynasty? It seems like the um maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, I, um, she she needs to build a title contention, right? So <laughs> she'll maybe beat. I just don't see what match she has beyond being in the in this TBS title match. Well, um, she could just face that or, or Sky Blue. That feel that feels very cold. But it's her first match. That's that's the hook, right? Well, um, okay. and then the next pay per view might be her versus either Willow or Julie Hart for the title. Well, they certainly didn't do anything to lead you to Sky Blue out of the out of this. But they she to... knows her finisher. <laughs> they, they they don't need to do much, you know. They yeah. They they could just she could call somebody out or host an open challenge. Then we had quite the interview. Uh, by the way, I th I thought the match was really excellent between these four. You know, the ad pace of action was really fast. I thought everybody was on their mark. I think this match was to me like a really good reminder of just how much the entire this little mid card cluster in the women's division has really kind of leveled up over the past. I don't know, couple of years. It feels at this point, Willow and Stat in particular. I I think their offense looks like so heavy and so good their timing is fantastic so i would really love to see like all four of these women along with julia hart be elevated up to the main title programs um over the next 12 months dustin rhodes was interviewed by renee and as everyone knows he is three and one this year and he notes that all of my matches in AEW have been great they're all bangers <laughs> I mean, this guy, I mean, no, uh, no, no, nothing humble here about Dustin Rhodes. Every match I've had is a banger. And at 55, I'm as passionate as ever. And then, folks, you know, it's it's a big time of the wrestling season. And we are getting the butcher who walks in and Dustin Rhodes starts to, like, wave his hand at, like, what's that smell? And the butcher informs him, my mustache has its own musk. And then Butcher <laughs> says, or Dustin says, you remember that bunkhouse match? The whole crowd, oh, of course. And this leads to a challenge. It's coming up Friday, Rampage, Dustin Rhodes, The Butcher 2. Who was in the bunkhouse match? It was these two? Uh, yes, I assume so. These two had a bunkhouse match? Um, they were involved in one, yes. Oh, okay. Well, um, you don't remember? <laughs> Well, no, um, but I do remember. Well, I, I do the remember man, that the man has a, the man doesn't clean his mustache. Okay, yeah. All my brain power was used up uh, remembering Dustin Runnels' um, 2024 record uh, at, at three and one. Yeah, I you know I, I I'm not against something like this. Like I think Dustin is such an underutilized member of this roster. Um, like he's so good for his. I mean, whether or not he's at his age, but the fact that he's 55 and like still able to wrestle at the level he's at, but more importantly, cut the cut the level of promo that he's constantly, anytime I've seen him on TV, is able to cut. I mean, that's somebody who I think you can really do so much more with than just, you know, um, the occasional Rampage match. Um, so I'm happy to see this, but man, this also feels like a match nobody could care about. You know, like... What are you talking about? <laughs> It's like his mustache has not been washed. <laughs> like He's I don't even wrestle this guy. Like to, to to spend any time with this, like on this match, promoting it for a rampage match. I I think it just kind of, it's almost like a waste of dynamite time. I like there are ways that were I think you should integrate rampage into into your dynamite promotion, but it needs to be with stars. You know, Dustin should be going after somebody that you should be, you would be turning on rampage just to see a match against the butcher immediately to be conveys that it's, it's going to be irrelevant in, in the grand scheme of things. This is a rematch of the November, 2020 bunkhouse match between these two. Gotcha. Now is this rematch a bunkhouse match or no, no, it's just a straight up match. All right. So that is coming up a banger. Then we went to Timeless Tony Storm and the returning Ben Mankiewicz of Turner Classic Movies. And she informed him to crispen your enunciation and then went through her catchphrase. And Ben will still not say tits out. And um, yeah, this just felt like um, we didn't want to go to Quebec City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, send us a video. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, maybe they were just they were crossing paths or like, let's film something. And they did. I wonder if they even filmed this like last time that Ben Ben Mankiewicz was in one of these. And they're just like, hey, we don't we got nothing for Tony Storm. Can you go back to that tape and and just fish something out? Can we just like roll like (laughs) 10 of these and we can have them on standby? Then there was a video on Swerve and promising to beat Takeshita. And then Joe will never forget what Swerve does to him after. Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta against Taven and Mike Bennett in the title tournament. Cassidy and Trent now have a shirt. Trent and Orange win the big one. And I think their odds of going to the finals have just increased. Oh, when they've invested merch into it. Yeah, sure. I could see these guys. um, I think everyone's looking at the obvious of a Bucks FTR final, but I certainly don't um, throw out the idea of, uh, you know, Cassidy and Trent with with the Bucks. I I don't think there's a... As far no, as TV I mean, time goes, I mean, it's the Bucks that that have received the most, but it's the best friends like right underneath them. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I can yeah. see that. So for for weeks, we have been talking about, you know, could there be a better name for the the Cope Open? And it turns out Excalibur <laughs> by mistake has given us one. And for for now until eternity on this show, I will be referring to Adam Copeland's title defenses as the Cope Opland. <laughs> I know you caught this too. Of course I did. And I <laughs> I nearly I, isolated this to play it again, but I was worried about YouTube uh, attacking uh, us of some sort. The Cope Opland. That is what I want this called every single time now. If you're a pro wrestling announcer, you're put on notice, okay? You, Dude, you better I do have wrong, every, okay? anything, anything that goes through John Pollock's ears must be perfect. All right. Cause he's not going to let anything slip. I think this is a great name. I think the Cope Opeland. <laughs> sure. It's great. Coming yes. up on Saturday. Uh, this is when, when Taven went for the super kick and he slipped. I thought he like tore his knee, but he seemed to be okay here. So there was this dangerous spot in the ring. Bennett pile drives Trent on the edge of the apron. They're working on Trent throughout the picture-in-picture break and then gets his knees up on a Cabrata attempt by Taven, tags in Cassidy, who hits the stun dog millionaire. They come back with the proton pack, and then after an assisted beach break with the double stomp by Trent, they go for the hug when Roderick Strong gets onto the apron, nails Chuck Taylor, so Strong gets caught by Orange Cassidy, and Taylor knocks Taven off the turnbuckle, allowing Trent to pin Bennett with the jackknife cover. Nine minutes, 32 seconds, and before they could all hug together in the center of the ring, the Bucks, using their elevator, come back out and then exit on said elevator. And they note how expensive it is for them to operate that elevator. So they just blew uh, company funds on this entrance and quick exit with no purpose. So should we have felt that way about Cody the entire time? He he used that same elevator? This guy kept us from profitability. <laughs> yes. Years one through three. <laughs> it's a pretty funny like i guess heel thing to to put on somebody they're using up corporate funds for a useless entrance yeah um this is the match we'll get next week the young bucks against cassidy and trent and that should be a really great match maybe a bit tougher to predict yeah i could see them going for the upset but i mean the bucks are like the bucks make the most sense um i just don't see there being zero chance of a of an upset in this well you got the t-shirt right so not the t-shirt renee is with kyle o'reilly um the best dressed man in AEW, white shirt, backwards hat here, and said, there's no way to get ready for being in the ring until you go and pull it off. And I felt good, but it's a deep roster. There's no easy matches. And he has asked about celebrating with the Undisputed Kingdom. Are you considering joining them? He says, no, I'm doing this alone, and I'm going to continue this Saturday in London. So that is part of the collision lineup. Kyle O'Reilly in action, the Cope Opeland, Righteous and Lance Archer, against Brian Danielson, Claudio, and Shibata, which means Danielson and Claudio are going from Arena Mexico on Friday night to London, Ontario on Saturday night. Wow. That's a long day of travel. And that means Shibata's probably staying up in Canada for the next few days. Oh, I can only imagine what his his road trip is like from Quebec City to London over the next few days. Yeah. And then in the tag title tournament matches on Saturday, FTR takes on the Infantry and Top Flight against Big Bill and Ricky Starks, who I feel Mm -hmm. we have not seen in a while. Uh, Starks and Bill, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I I wish like they they would have announced um Kyle's opponent, but I'm guessing it's not going to be a big opponent if they did. Mark Hominick. 
in London, Ontario. Yeah, maybe Sam Stout. Why not? For sure, uh, Chris Hord. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we do this show and we just assume it's we're just for us. one another yeah. with nobody listening, which <laughs> maybe we have zero listeners. Swerve Strickland and Kanosuke Takeshita is the main event. I did think this one took a, took a while to get going, and maybe it was the crowd, but mm. I did, like it was all Takeshita beating down on this guy. The key spot being a brain buster that Swerve sold for all it was worth, and teasing the idea he's got like a stinger that he's working through uh, during the match. But like this was one way traffic from Takeshita until Swerve would spike him with a DDT off the turnbuckle and lands the spiral tap for a two count, and this is where. Things are picking up. We say uh, Poison Rana by Takeshita, followed by a Blue Thunder Bomb. And then the Swerve Stomp is delivered onto the edge of the apron. And after he leaps off the top, he is uh, Takeshita catches him with a Power Bomb in midair. Swerve then stops a Falcon Arrow and gets hit with the Power Drive Knee. That led to a big near fall. And then after the house call, the Swerve Stomp connects, Takeshita kicks out. And the crowd goes wild for this. Then Swerve lifts him up for the big pressure and it is stopped. Jumping knee connects and then a pop up. Swerve comes down with the stomp and follows with big pressure. And the the angle at which Takeshita's head was going down to the mat, they cut the camera mm. so you didn't get to see him if he like tucked at the end. Uh, but man, did it look scary when he was going yeah. down here and Swerve pins him uh, to get the win. He is now the number one contender. And Tony Schiavone states, if that match wasn't five stars, then I don't know what is. And I wasn't going to go five stars on this one, but it was, it was, a, it was a very good match. Uh, in particular, I thought the last uh, like six, seven minutes. I'd love to know Tony's uh, star system rankings. Like what, you know, of all the wrestling matches he's called, what, how does he rank them? You know, I don't I could, know. I could buy that. This would be up there. You know, I, we, I don't know what Tony's seen versus what you've seen. Well, it was a five-star match from Tony Schiavone's um, judging. And yeah. now that this sets up Swerve, they explain, we'll get the shot at Samoa Joe at Dynasty. Uh, this was just a, a, an outstanding match, you know? And, and I I struggle to think if there's going to be a match on the pay-per-view that'll even, like, that'll be better, like, in terms of quality than something like this. Um, what do we have, though? Kingston Dan and... Danielson and Osprey? You, you don't think the... Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, that's gonna be. I, I think this. I wasn't <laughs> as high on this match as you were. I did. I did think it was very good. Um, yeah, that match will be better than this. But this is uh, to me like maybe I'm just kind of like so wild by Kanosuke to Takeshita. Where like especially now playing heel, mm -hmm. he's just unlocked this like very dominant monster aura within him. And like to me, I I definitely see at least within AEW where like there's a priority on in ring ability. He can be a future champion. Mm -hmm. You know, especially because he is, he's got callous on by his side doing a lot of the talking, but he can wrestle like he's your dominant champion in every single match where he defends the championship can feel like epic, like every match he's had on Dynamite has felt epic, uh, but just without sort of like the context of it being maybe as important. So he's just too good to ignore. And I think um, Swerve, like, you know, they have he has great chemistry with everybody because he's just so adaptable and fluid with his style and, and just creativity. So I really like the match. Five star or not, it, it, that's deb debatable, I suppose. Yeah, I also liked in the Takeshita video package that just reminding people about the Omega wins, about beating Jericho, like. It's it's one thing to do these matches and you have these outcomes, but I think part of pro wrestling is like drilling it into your head. So these things feel important that you keep referencing them and people don't forget them as well. So Renee is backstage. She gets the reaction from Samoa Joe. And I guess next week they're going to do a contract signing and he will make it clear what Swerve is getting himself into. And you are not that man. So mm -hmm. fiery. Mm -hmm. And from Samoa Joe. And so the pay-per-view is looking at Samoa Joe and Swerve. Will Ospreay against Brian Danielson. As of now, Julia Hart against Willow Nightingale. And the finals of the tag title tournament are the matches we have with about uh, three plus weeks until the pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. Plenty of time to add, uh, I don't know, five, six more matches to this card. Or ten. So. Yeah, I, 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 you know, this this uh, edition of Dynamite was kind of interesting because it was almost like uh, an exact counter um, and, and 
antithesis to this week's edition of Raw. Very high on in-ring action, but I would say low on like what I consider to be like sort of more grand scheme storytelling. You know, I I don't know how much of this show you needed to watch in order to like keep up with um ongoing storylines, you know. And that's maybe not even what AEW is necessarily known for, but I'll say like I felt last week's show felt um a lot more important. And that's just not from being there. I, I think to me that's it's strict because of like the level of star power. I felt a lot of top stars were missing in action for this one, though you did get an Osprey match, which you know counts for a whole lot. Um and as an alternative style of programming, I mean I I I do appreciate that we had two different sort of versions of what what you know might be considered very good wrestling in the same week where's my swearing i want my swearing on aew um the other guys have taken it th- th- that's right yeah um you can't well you could say certain things you just yeah you know, we'll wait till next week hey we you want to go through these rankings here sure updated rankings as of march 27 2024 so i guess we're on a monthly schedule with these uh rankings now we have here uh, sorry. And the men's side of things, first of all, we have our men's champions. Of course, they are Samoa Joe, your world champion, uh, Adam Copeland, uh, Cope, Copla, Cope, Cope Opeland, uh host. Cope Opeland host is your TNT champion. Your international champion is Roderick Strong, and your continental champion is Kazuchika Okada, of course, now broken off from the rest of the former continental crown. Your number one contender as of this uh, moment is Swerve Strickland, followed by Orange Cassidy. Followed by John Moxley, followed by Will Ospreay, and followed by Brian Danielson, rounding out the top five. Does wait, it... wait a minute. So Swerve and Takeshita were battling to be the number one contender, and this one loss sent Takeshita out of the top five. That could happen. I mean, if if so, now Takeshita would have two losses versus. I don't know what the records are for the guess, other man, four. It's, it's a it's a tough top five to to crack when that can send you down so far. Okay, right. Uh, so your women's champions are timeless Tony, Tony Storm, world, uh, women's world champion, and your TBS champion Julie Hart. Your number one contender at this moment is Thunder Rosa, which is of course consistent with um the storytelling that they've done, and, and uh, it plays into her getting that win, and she leapfrogs Diana Perazzo, even though Perazzo you know, has the, the, the phantom cover on Tony storm from the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. And then very interestingly, Mariah may is number two, followed by Willow Nightingale, followed by the aforementioned Deanna Perrazzo, and then followed lastly by Serena Deeb in the top five. So uh, are there any sort of further things or notes you want to say about that? No, I think it sets up Thunder Rosa as the next challenger, if not Deanna being involved a- as well. I mean, you could see a three-way there, and Willow has the TBS title shot as of now. How do they determine who challenges for the secondary championships? Is it reliant at all on, on these rankings? I have no idea. Right, okay. Your tag team champions are uh, currently held by... No one. Well, uh, vacant. Multi-ton champions, vacant. And your number one contenders are the best friends, followed by Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, followed by John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli, and then Big Bill and Ricky Starks, and then FTR. So uh, obviously the the tournament kind of uh, trumps these rankings. And then your trios champions are the acclaimed and daddy ass, and your number one contenders uh, presently are the Bang Bang Gang, which is, again, consistent with storylines. And then the elite, which would be um, Okada in the box and then you have the blackpool combat club followed by the undisputed kingdom and then lastly the house of black so man could we get okada and billy gunn in a ring of course have the they not had that box. match gun billy had that singles match with tanahashi years tanahashi. ago in uh yeah. in long long beach but i don't think he's had a singles with okada that's still to be or even dream, a trios many dream matches of. to make in aw right. Okay, well, that was Dynamite and your rankings update, courtesy of Wei Ting. Uh, so now we will go on. If you have a super chat, now is the time to submit it, and we will go to your feedback on the forum. Let's go to forum.postwrestling.com. Again, uh, we should take the time to remind people, if you're going to be in Philadelphia looking for a place to hang out with fellow Post Wrestling listeners, go to, uh, as soon as I get this graphic off so I can see the location, 1903 Chestnut Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, 2.30 p.m. on the Sunday. We will be there with our friends at Poison Rana to host a little listener get-together. It's completely free to join. Just uh, come by with, uh, you know, 
a, a, a good attitude. Okay. That's the price of admission. Come with a good attitude. Okay. Or, or not, whichever <laughs> brings you to, uh, to the bar. We will look forward to seeing you. Also, I will mention that we are continuously updating, uh, the WrestleMania week schedule at postwrestling.com slash mania. If you want a listing of all the events and shows going on mania week, match listings, uh, links to get tickets, all of that postwrestling.com slash mania, uh, John Cena and myself are keeping things as up to date as possible. And we appreciate those that have been, uh, submitting, uh, info to us uh, as well that we are updating and we have a lot of uh, wrestlemania week coverage be, uh, lined up here both on the website as well as at post, post wrestling cafe uh john cena will um be contributing heavily as well as some of the other um listeners or, or frequent hosts here at post wrestling so we will definitely have you covered both on the uh, website text-based side as well as on the audio side of things so sign up at post wrestling cafe.com yes all right great time to jump on board let's go to the feedback you want to start us off john Andrew writes, so I get that Mercedes is a star, but tonight showed that she still needs help with talking. I know commentary is a lot different than cutting live promos, but I think they should look at putting a manager with her, potentially Stokely Hathaway. I also think she should have a match soon, even before the pay-per-view. The show was good. I do like how they bookended the show with incredible matches, and they seem to do a lot more with their video packages. Dynasty is looking like a good show. I think um, the Stokely pairing could you know could be um one of the end results of everything that's going on with willow and stokely um so i i think it's a wonderful pairing on, on paper um it would be great for stokely hathaway would be probably the biggest thing he you know he he would have and i think it'd be great for mercedes so i personally like it um we'll see if they execute let's go to brian in new jersey who says two very strong matches to bookend the show showcasing two future world champions i was amazed that shibata was able to have a match like that i thought the two matches in the tag title tournament each had a few hiccups but also a lot of excitement i thought the women had a good showing too mercedes less so i'm glad they can carve out time on dynamite for video packages like the one they had tonight not much announced for next week's dynamite but i'll be missing most or all of it as i bought a ticket today for, for the first live show i'm seeing wrestlemania week nick and ryan nemitz Hunkamania on April 3rd at the Helium Comedy Club. Drinker's Pub that Sunday is a possibility. Okay, well. Oh, no. uh, what, no, what, what can we do to woo you, Brian? You know, like uh, no, we're a game month. day decision for Brian. We'll see how he feels <laughs> on Sunday. I understand how it is. Um, uh, so I'm guessing that's a comedy show. Yes, yes. That would, okay, that would be cool. Good. Jordan from the Bronx. AW is currently spoiled with riches. And is that how the saying goes? It's a um spoiled, spoiled with riches, with riches. I guess. that makes sense getting yeah. okada and osprey matches between 8 and 10 p.m was unheard of a year ago the roster is deep and everyone has stepped up their game swerve continues to elevate his game to a different level willow being the number one contender sets up a lot of possibilities if she wins the tnt i think she means tbs title i'm imagining that the tag title match will be the bucks and ftr again but i'd like to see top flight get the match instead dynasty is looking like another banger show i'm just upset but that my new work schedule will cause me to have to watch it the next day Okay, we'll stay offline. That would be my suggestion. Quit your job is what I would suggest. All I mean, right? where are your priorities when it comes to, um, you know, watching uh, pro wrestling? Uh, all right, we go up next to Rob, who says, Solid Dynamite tonight. Osprey, Shibata, Swerve, and Swerve Takeshita were all worth staying up past 2 a.m. for. Shibata's sell, the Oth Cutter, had more snap than an evening of cards. I'm not that good of a poker player. <laughs> Swerve selling of the stinger from Takeshita's brain buster kind of was very well done. Are you we sure this isn't Nick and Ryan Nemeth's hunkamania? <laughs> Swerve selling of the stinger from Takeshita's brain buster counter was very well done. Swerve couldn't power through it and it had to had to adapt his game plan. Um okay. Uh regarding Mercedes Bonet, who do you see her facing at Dynasty? I'm hopeful that Statlander gets the nod for that one. I mean, I thought she was going to be involved with Willow, and I said, like, that's what all the the buildup so far has been towards is Willow. I that that's a match I think they're they're planning for after Dynasty. I would well, assume Dynasty's coming up first, so I, I don't know. Um, I think it'll have to be, well, you know, Serena. Um, I guess it's Serena Deeb. Um, is she gunning for? She's not really involved in the TBS. Like, has she uh, set her sights on any champion so far? No, but I mean, she's like listed like anyone who wants to challenge me. Uh, yeah. come, like you could do that. It's just there's been no hint at that. I would argue, like, why? Why didn't we just start from from that at, at this point? Um, 
I almost don't think it really matters. I think it could be anybody. It could be Deep. It could be Sky Blue. It could be Chris Statlander. Um, and, and it or it could be Anna J. Like the the draw and the appeal is to see Mercedes Monet have her first match on a pay per view, right? And I don't think you should be giving out like the the match that they're building to just yet. So Mercedes versus someone. Yeah, that's how they should promote it. Kyle O'Reilly. Okay, I wouldn't mind that. That'd be a great match. Yeah. Last voice, uh, last person we will go to is Cody from Maine. Two very strong matches to open and close the show, which made for a solid episode. I know they wouldn't let Shibata compete if he wasn't okay to do so, but I'll always be nervous for him, especially when he starts to push himself more, like we've seen against Danielson and now Osprey. His grappling heavy matches when he first returned felt like a distant memory. I really do hope Dynasty is Swerve's night. I can't envision a losing scenario that doesn't result in lost momentum. Even Hangman costing him the match could end up feeling like a retread. And for Takeshita, it's perfectly fine to lose to both Osprey and Swerve, the two that most expect to be the next two world champions. But my hope is that they view him as a true main event guy rather than a star maker if that's the case he needs a big win or storyline development moving forward i totally agree yeah i i think you you know yes uh losing to osprey and losing to swerve acceptable but um i think you can only well you know what we've been saying this about Takeshita for a long long time like he's one of those guys you kind of put out there just to give a banger to somebody and he's almost like you almost kind of forget he's he's lost as much as he has because he tends to be more over because people are talking about what what a great wrestler he is afterwards but um but i don't know like everybody kind of you know ha has their time and and audiences will lose patience and it, people's sort of auras will continue to wear thin but like i mentioned in, in the review of the match i i really do see world title holder level like um possibilities with him and that's not that easy to achieve when you're a non-english speaker um in, in this company they have somebody obviously in nokata that they've already belted and they could go all the way with with, with the world championship in the future because he's already established so much outside of this company but Takeshita is somebody that like i think could purely earn it based off of in-ring ability um and, and i hope to see it in the future but there are a lot of people waiting for that spot so you've got like a a whole lineup of people in waiting for this championship. Maybe they need to create a new championship. You can never have enough. <laughs> yeah. The more the merrier. Isn't that what they, they've always said about championships? Uh, I, I guess so. All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in for this edition of Rewind to Dynamite. Wei Ting and I will be back on Thursday. It is the 13th installment of Talk, where we will just turn the mics on and see where it takes us so look forward to that uh thursday afternoon slash evening up at postwrestlingcafe.com and again it's a new month beginning april 1st and if you jump onto the cafe you get uh that gives you 30 days of access and we're going to be having a lot coming your way next week with our travels to philadelphia a lot of extra stuff that we will be putting up on the cafe and then shows saturday and sunday night after wrestlemania 40 which God yeah. knows what state we will be in when we are hitting record on night one and night two uh, we shall find out, yeah, as as we record uh, in all manners of uh, places throughout the city. So uh, if you sign up right now, you already sign on for access over the, the next 30 days. So that includes WrestleMania week and, of course, uh, everything else to come in April. So thank you guys for being there. And uh, if you haven't signed on yet, consider giving it a try this month. Yeah. And on the cafe, in addition to talk. On Friday, we will have MCU Later coming at you with episode three with Rich Fan and WH Park of X-Men 97, which is uh, going to be my viewing as soon as we're done here. Uh, yeah. I have, I'm officially all in on X-Men 97. The second episode was great. And, really I'm great. and I'm officially going to suggest you as a future guest on MCU Later. Maybe. We'll see. Um, so that's coming up Friday, Saturday collision course is back with Kate from Montreal and John Ceno as well. So look out for all of that on the cafe and we will speak with you on talk.